The Fourth Stall by Chris Rylander, a first chapter Friday read aloud with The Word Nerd. Today as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another first chapter Friday video. This week I'm going to be sharing with you, hands down, the funniest book I have ever read in my entire life, and it is The Fourth Stall by the author Chris Rylander. It's the first in a series of three, and I can tell you that I have never, ever laughed harder when I've read a book out loud to students before. Um, and the reason that this book is so funny is that Chris Rylander does an amazing job of characterization. So if you're wanting to study how an author uh, creates characters that feel real, you definitely are going to want to read this book. Um, and to prove that, like right in the very first page when you open it up, they give you this little excerpt. It's not even a prologue, but just kind of a taste of what is to come. And it's the perfect, uh, a perfect way to show you, A, how funny this is, and B, how great his characterization is. So before I even read the back, before I tell you any more about this book, I'm just going to read you this itty bitty part. Kitten is by far the king of the bullies at our school. Actually, he's the king of everybody. No one messes with Kitten, not even me. But he doesn't cause a lot of problems either. I have to hire Kitten a lot to keep total control over the other bullies. If one of them ever gets too tough or too mean, then I just send out Kitten. I actually wanted Kitten to be my permanent strongman, but he wasn't really into being constantly ordered around in public, and who was I to argue? In the end, I'm glad Joe ended up getting the job, but sometimes I wonder what could have been. Either way, the point is that Kit and I are usually on the same side, thankfully. Kitten got his nickname because he looks like a kitten. Not really, like with fur and stuff, but you know metaphorically or whatever. He has a real nice look to him with neat, short, and perfectly parted hair, and he always wears sweaters and collared shirts, and he has big, kind eyes. Plus, he's really little and meek one of the small sixth graders in the school. His voice is real high and soft, like he might start crying at any moment. He looks and acts like the biggest mama's boy in the whole state. So how can he be the top bully? Kitten is a psychopath, pure and simple. And so that's just a little taste uh, of this story uh, to come. Basically, a quick rundown. Um, no, I'll just read you the back so you know. Do you need something? Mac can get it for you. It's what he does. He and his best friend and business manager, Vince. Their methods might sometimes run afoul of the law or at least the school code of conduct, but if you have a problem and no one else can help, and if you can pay him, Mac is on your side. His office is located in the East Wing boys' bathroom, fourth stall from the high window, and business is booming. Or at least it was until this particular Monday, because this Monday is when Mac and Vince find out that the trouble with solving everyone else's problems is that there's no one left to solve yours. So uh, the basic premise is that um, Mac is going to round up all of the elementary school bullies to take on an even bigger bully, an even bigger problem. Um, and as uh, someone who has worked in a middle school for 12 years. Uh, I can just tell you this book is so spot on. All right, chapter one, The Fourth Stall by Chris Rylander, book one. You need something? I can get it for you. You have a problem? I can solve it. That's why they come to me. By they, I mean every kid in school. First graders up to eighth graders, everyone comes to me for help and most of the time I'm happy to provide it. For a small fee, of course. My office is located in the East Wing boys' bathroom, fourth stall from the high window. My office hours are during early recess, lunch, and afternoon recess. Sometimes I do pro bono work. I don't know why free is called pro bono, but it is. If your situation seems important enough, I just may offer my services without my usual fees of money or favors, but that doesn't happen too often. And when it does, it's usually because Vince asks me to. Vince is my best friend and right-hand man. He's a good guy. In addition to being awesome with numbers, he's also the most book smart kid I know and the best business manager a guy could have. We started this business together, so when he gives me one of those looks that only I know that says, hey, Mac, you should cut this kid a break and do this one pro bono, 
I listened to him. I know you shouldn't mix your business and personal life, but we run a tight operation and we've been friends since kindergarten. My real name is Christian Barrett, but everybody calls me Mac. Mac is short for MacGyver. This eighth grader, Billy Benson, called me that once and it stuck. And now it's just Mac because people are lazy. Right now, you might be wondering how a little blue-eyed sixth grader with shaggy dark brown hair could end up with a business like this, and I don't blame you. I hardly believe it myself sometimes. It's actually a pretty long story that's probably best left for later, so for now, let's just say that it involves an old trailer park playground, a vampire, and one angry fourth grader, and we'll leave it at that for now. Anyways, I mostly handy easy stuff, like getting kids test answers or forged hall passes and doctor's notes or video games that their parents won't let them play. But every once in a while, something tough comes my way. Like my last client on this particular Monday, he was one of the most difficult problems I had ever faced. I was sitting behind my desk in the fourth stall from the high window. Maybe I should stop here to explain how we fit my desk into the stall. A lot of kids will tell you that the toilet was cleared out years ago due to a huge accident. They say some joker tried to flush a whole box of black cats and four cherry bombs down the toilet. Supposedly the porcelain shards exploded everywhere and severed his arm and now he has a hook for a hand and he lives in some special institution for kids who think they're pirates. I know the truth though, because I have connections the other kids don't. The toilet was removed when some kid figured out Principal Dickerson's bathroom schedule. Apparently, old people use the bathroom at the same time every day. And this kid, Jimmy Snickers, found out that Principal Dickerson used the fourth stall from the high window in the east wing bathroom every single day at 12.02. Always. Why did he use that exact toilet? Maybe because it, the fourth stall from the high window was the biggest stall in the bathroom and had handrails that, needed to use, that he needed to use because he was so old. I don't know. I have no idea. I know a lot of stuff about this school, but some things are just a mystery and meant to stay that way. Anyways, one day during the morning recess, Jimmy brought in six bottles of industrial superglue to the fourth stall from the high window. Now, Jimmy was a pretty clever kid, so he knew that simply supergluing Dickerson's butt cheeks to the seat was not enough because the seat could easily be removed with just a simple wrench. Instead, he lathered up not only the seat, but also the screws and the joints holding the seat to the toilet bowl itself. The concoction of glue he created, combined with years of built-up pee and rust and gunk, bonded together like the most sticky, sticky cement ever invented. Principal Dickerson wasn't going anywhere. Dickerson didn't yell for help because it would have been embarrassing to be found by a student. So instead, he waited and waited and waited. And eventually, the janitor found him at 5 o'clock that evening. Even though at that point Dickerson was really hungry from missing lunch, at least he was able to use the bathroom. They had to call in plumbers to remove the entire toilet and ship both Dickerson and his new porcelain shorts to the hospital, where the doctors were able to surgically separate the two. Dickerson never ordered a new toilet because the process of doing so would just bring unwanted attention to the whole embarrassing ordeal. That and the school had spent most of its money that year on buying these cool Nike uniforms and track suits for all the sports team. Then, by the following year, the kids and teachers probably just forgot all about the missing toilet, which was fine with Dickerson. So the fourth stall from the high window remained toiletless and became the perfect place for my office, mostly because it was the farthest reaches of the school's east wing, where there were no classrooms except for the rarely used band room. The bathroom was also secure and private due to an arrangement I had with the school janitor. In fact, he had even given me a key so I could lock the bathroom up during non-business hours to keep kids from coming in and messing with my stuff. Maybe I'll get into that arrangement more later on, but for now, I should probably get back to my story at hand. So, where was I? Oh yeah, it was Monday. It was lunchtime. I was sitting behind the desk and my crew had installed that my crew had installed in the fourth stall. Business had been a little slower than usual the past couple days, but otherwise it had been just another normal day up at the office to that point. Joe, my strong man, stood outside the bathroom, forming lines and regulating the flow of kids. Only one customer was in loud only one customer was allowed inside the bathroom at any given time. Joe also kept out any unwanted company. He was an eighth grader, the biggest kid at our school. He towered over the other students like an NBA player at a midget convention. No one missed with Joe, not even me. But he was loyal, and I compensated him well. Joe ushered in kid after kid, first come, first serve. Vince was the only person other than me and the, and the clients allowed inside the bathroom when we were seeing customers. He usually stood outside my office where he patted the kids down and checked them for recording devices, stink bombs, and other undesirables. 
The second to last client of that afternoon was a big football player named Robert Robert Hovsgoland. He looked funny, sitting in the small plastic chair in the cramped stall. His huge knees were almost level with his shoulders. I had a good feeling about the kid right away, probably because he was wearing a Chicago Cubs jersey. What can I do for you, Robert? I asked. Need more playing time? Less playing time? A girlfriend? Help breaking up with a girlfriend? No, not exactly, he said. It has to do with a girl, though, right? He nodded, and I thought I saw him blush a little bit. I want to take a girl to that new movie, Idiots Doing Stupid Stunts, but I don't know how to get us in. It's rated R, and my dad's a cop, and he's obsessed with the whole law is a law thing, so we won't go for it. Anyways, I already kind of told her I could get us in, so I'm just wondering if you could help me somehow. I don't want her to think I'm a liar. I think it can help you out, Robert. When, you, when were you two planning on going, I asked. Well, I invited her to go Saturday night. This Saturday. I need a few moments, please, I said. I saw him shift uncomfortably in the small chair as I looked through my books. My books were a few notebooks that I kept to record, uh, that I used, that I kept. My books were a few notebooks that I used to keep record of customers and their requests, such as who owed me favors and other stuff like that. I also kept a record of all my connections, like people who could get me stuff that most kids didn't have access to, such as Vince's older brother, Victor. We use him to get us stuff that only 18 year olds can buy. Vince kept his own books too, but his dealt more with how much money we had and who owed us money and other financial stuff like that. I checked my books for the problem at hand. I knew a guy at the theater who owed me a favor, but he didn't work on Saturday. I hoped Robert would be flexible. Okay, Robert, here's the deal. I can get you two in, but not Saturday night. Do you think she'd agree to go Friday instead? Yeah, I think so, he said as he scratched the back of his head. Good. Just tell her that you have to babysit your little brother or something Saturday. That usually works. Look for a cashier named Derek. He's tall and has short, dark hair. He'll be expecting you. Sounds good? Yeah, except that I don't have any little brothers or sisters, so I don't know what... Robert, 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 use your imagination. Tell her you have to go to your mom's birthday on Saturday or something. It's okay. Everybody can tell a little harmless white lie every once in a while, right? He hesitated. I could tell that he was a good guy because he seemed to be such a terrible liar. Yeah, okay, uh, I can do that. What do I owe you, he finally said. <clears throat> tell you what, I didn't fix your problem perfectly, plus you're a Cubs fan, so we'll do it at a discount. How does $5 and a small favor sound? A favor, he asked. Yeah, there may be a time when I need your help with something. Don't worry, it won't be anything huge. It's not like I'm going to ask you for your kidneys or anything like that. Robert chuckled, but he sounded a little nervous. Sure, sounds good. All right, just bring the money back any time this week. Actually, I have it now. There was absolutely no doubt left that this was definitely a good kid. I love it when customers paid up front. I quickly wrote down a note in my books that Robert was someone to potentially employ in the future. His size could come in handy at some point. Great, give it to Vince before you leave and just be ready if I ever need that favor. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Mac, thanks, he said, and then squeezed out of the stall. I sat calmly and waited for the next client, not even suspecting for a second that he would be the biggest problem that had ever stepped into my office. All right, if you want to find out what that problem is and how Mac works to solve it, you should totally pick up this copy of The Force Cell, especially if you like to laugh, especially uh, if you love reading character-driven stories with really amazing, funny, very realistic characters. That's it for today. Hope to come back again for another First Chapter Friday Read Aloud, and happy reading! To continue reading The Fourth Stall by Chris Rylander, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. This week's mystery quote says, It all seemed pretty funny, now that it was over. Make sure you check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I have tons of great middle grade and YA stories waiting for you. Please like this video and subscribe so you can stay connected for more great First Chapter Friday videos and other videos you can use in your classroom. Happy reading!